Why is the largest planet in the solar system, Jupiter, so enormous? Indeed, Jupiter is 300 times the size of Earth and has 2.5 times the mass of all the planets in the solar system combined, though of course, it's still a thousand times smaller than the Sun. For a long time, Jupiter's gigantic size puzzled astronomers. Calculations showed that during its formation, Jupiter couldn't have grown to the observed dimensions. Until recently, I was convinced that Jupiter's size was among the unresolved mysteries of our universe. However, I recently learned that scientists have a rather clever theory about it, which I want to share with you today. Subscribe to the channel and let's dive into it. Firstly, let's talk about how, according to modern understanding, the planets in the solar system formed and how similar objects in space form in general. We already know of over 5.5 thousand planets around other stars. So in this sense, our star system is not unique. It is believed that planets began forming shortly after the completion of the sun's formation, when our star was still a very young one, not yet reaching the temperatures for nuclear fusion in its core, which powers the sun today. The material for planet formation came from the remnants of a gas and dust cloud, the compression of which, under its gravitational force, gave birth to the sun itself. Later, radiation pressure from the young sun dispersed much of this cloud, but some of it remained as a structure known as a protoplanetary disk. Today, we observe similar structures around young stars, such as those of the T Tauri type. By the way, studying the protoplanetary disks of distant stars helps us learn more about how planets in our own solar system formed. The term protoplanetary disk itself suggests a dual structure consisting firstly of gas and secondly of small solid particles, dust grains, with sizes typically around a tenth of a millimeter. From a chemical standpoint, protoplanetary disks are primarily composed of hydrogen and helium, the main components of cosmic gas clouds. However, they also contain other chemical elements such as carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, aluminum, silicon, iron, and more. These elements are the legacy passed down to the solar system from the ancestors of the sun, the luminous bodies of previous generations that shone long before the sun's formation. It was in the nuclear furnaces of these ancient stars that the cores of atoms of these chemical elements formed, which later became the sun, the solar system, earth, and ultimately us. Of course, in the protoplanetary disk, these element atoms existed not just by themselves, but also in various compounds such as water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, methane, and so on. Just as cosmic gas and dust clouds, under their gravitational force, can condense into dense droplets of matter known as stars, the particles in the protoplanetary disk, under their gravitational force, condensed over time into smaller droplets known as planets. There are several models of how this happens, with the most widely accepted being the theory that initially, solid dust particles stick together due to gravity, forming something like a fairly loose mass of matter, also called a planetesimal. As this body grows, it increasingly attracts material from the protoplanetary disk. The fall of this material onto the surface of the planetesimal leads to the release of gravitational energy in the form of heat. The planetesimal gradually heats up until finally, under the influence of the heat released, its interior begins to melt. During this process, heavier elements such as iron and beyond sink into the molten mass, forming a massive core, while lighter elements remain on the surface. This process is called gravitational differentiation, and its initiation marks the transformation of a planetesimal into a protoplanet. Today in the solar system, we observe objects representing both planetesimals and protoplanets. The former includes, for example, the asteroids Arakoth or Lutetia, while the latter includes asteroids Vesta and Pallas, as well as the dwarf planet Ceres. The fact that small celestial bodies didn't undergo the process of gravitational differentiation has one very interesting consequence. Their surfaces still hold high concentrations of heavy elements such as gold, platinum, palladium, iridium, osmium, and so on, the ones that mostly sank deep into the Earth's core during its formation. In simpler terms, asteroid surfaces should be quite rich in these rare elements highly valued on Earth. And since traveling to space, despite all its challenges, is still easier than digging deep into the Earth, mining these materials on asteroids as space exploration progresses could become a lucrative business.
but we'll delve into that in more detail next time if you find it interesting. In addition to the solid particles of the protoplanetary disk merging into planetesimals and then melting into protoplanets, there is also the process of attracting gas from the protoplanetary disk to these planets. Regarding how these processes relate to each other, there is no unanimous opinion. Most astronomers believe that the formation of gas envelopes begins after a sufficiently massive solid foundation of the planet has formed. Some argue that both processes occur simultaneously, reinforcing each other. There's even an opinion suggesting that the process starts with gas, in which drops of a denser gaseous medium form, becoming nuclei of solid material concentration. One thing is clear. No matter how this process happens, the time for its occurrence was quite limited. It's essential to remember that at the center of the protoplanetary disk is a star, whose radiation gradually blows gas out of the disk. Initially, the star's radiation clears the gas from the inner regions of the star system. This is why, near the Sun, where Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are located, planets primarily composed of solid particles, less susceptible to such radiation blowout, formed. The gas envelopes of these planets ended up relatively thin because, by that time and place, there was very little gas left. However, in more distant areas from the star, the gas concentration quickly drops. Calculations and observations of other stellar systems suggest that a high gas concentration in the protoplanetary disk can be maintained for no more than 10 to 15 million years. Yet, according to calculations, forming a massive planet like Jupiter would require much more time, at least 100 million years. In other words, within the widely accepted model of planet formation, Jupiter simply wouldn't have had enough time to become so large. However, it did become that large. And to explain this, an additional factor had to intervene. That factor turned out to be the sun and its radiation. In astronomy, there's a concept called the snow line, an imaginary boundary of a star system where water can only exist in a solid state, i.e. as ice. As we know, in space, where there is virtually zero external pressure, the existence of substances in a liquid phase is impossible. Water, for example, can only be either vapor or ice. At a sufficient distance from the star, the intensity of its radiation drops significantly, leaving no room for any either. Beyond the snow line, it becomes cold enough for water to exist only as ice. It's worth repeating that we're talking about conditions in open space, where there is no day or night, no seasons, and substances are constantly heated by solar rays with nothing to shield them from this heating. This is why on Earth, for example, water can exist in both solid and liquid states, but in Earth's orbit, only in a gaseous state. In the solar system, the snow line is located at a distance of approximately five astronomical units from the sun. That is at distances five times the radius of Earth's orbit, precisely where Jupiter is located. And this is not a coincidence. The interesting process that occurred right at the edge of the snow line in the protoplanetary disk could significantly accelerate the formation of planets. Beyond the snow line, the gas environment of the gas dust cloud underwent desublimation, a transition from a gaseous state to a solid one. The center of this desublimation was the solid particles of the cloud, seemingly covered with a layer of ice. Growing in size due to this, the particles began to experience increased resistance from the gas environment, losing their velocity, losing speed, they descended to lower orbits around the sun. In other words, approaching it, eventually crossing the snow line and entering an area where solar heat gradually evaporated the ice from their surfaces, a process we observe today in comets approaching the sun. Once rid of the icy coating, the particles accelerated again. Their orbit height increased and they crossed the snow line once more, but in the opposite direction. Thus, two counterflowing streams of particles formed around the snow line cold ones approaching the sun and heated ones moving away from it. This means that at any given moment, the concentration of solid particles at the boundary was significantly higher than on either side of it. And the higher the particle concentration, the faster their gravitational cohesion and the formation of planetesimals, protoplanets, and so on. According to this theory, the migration of solid particles across the snow line became the doping that significantly accelerated the formation of Jupiter's core, which, according to modern research, is approximately 15 times the mass of Earth. 
and this happened quickly enough for the core to attract gas, primarily hydrogen, making up over 90% of Jupiter from the protoplanetary disk. By the way, in astronomy, not only water is referred to as ice, but also the solid states of other substances that are liquid or gaseous under earthly conditions, such as carbon dioxide, methane, and so on. Their snow lines are farther from the sun, and in the vicinity of these snow lines, other gas giants like Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune formed. However, since water appears to be the most prevalent of these substances, the effects associated with the water snow line turned out to be the strongest, and Jupiter became the largest of them all. Observations of protoplanetary disks around young stars indicate that very similar processes are taking place there. For example, observing the protoplanetary disk of the star Fomalhaut, located 25 light years from the sun, revealed several areas of increased substance concentration, somewhat resembling the rings around Saturn. Probably it is precisely in these areas that the formation of gas giants like Jupiter or Saturn is currently taking place. I must note that the above theory is not undisputed, and among astronomers, there are both supporters and critics. For example, it does not explain the formation of so-called hot Jupiters, massive planets located very close to their parent stars, much closer than the snow lines. By the way, in connection with the theory of snow lines, another question arises, for which I, by the way, have not yet found a clear answer. Why is there so much water on Earth? Our planet is far from the snow line, and where it formed, there should have been almost no water, or more precisely, water vapor, by the time of its existence. Therefore, there shouldn't have been a significant source of water on Earth. Earth is, in fact, the record holder for water content among all inner planets. Neither Mars nor Venus has water in such quantities. Astronomers have various theories about this, but personally, none of them seems sufficiently satisfactory to me. According to one of them, comets brought water to Earth, and comets are indeed largely composed of water ice. However, in that case, why didn't the same comets provide our neighbors, Venus and Mars, with sufficient water? I haven't found a clear answer to this question in scientific literature yet. If any of you, dear viewers, have come across something on this topic, I would be grateful if you could point me to where I can read about it. But even if this nature's puzzle remains unsolved for now, it's okay. Sooner or later, scientists will find an answer to this question just as they successfully resolved the mystery of Jupiter's anomalously large size.